uh, speaker today, uh, Professor Albert Chang. Uh, Albert got his PhD from the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, he's now a faculty member in the CS department of the University of Houston. Uh, Albert is an expert and uh, very prolific, I guess, in the area of, of real-time systems. Uh, he's published extensively in the leading journals and also conferences in the area. Now, in particular, uh, his publication about uh, incremental debugging of real-time systems uh, was a feature article in last year's uh, I3 Transactions on Computers. So today, actually, he will uh, uh, talk to us about that topic. And as a bonus, he will also describe uh, some of his recent work on uh, security for embedded systems. So I give the time to Abdul. Thank you, David. Yeah. OK, so the first part of the talk, and uh, major part of that, it's I'm going to talk about um, the uh, debugging and verification of real-time and embedded systems uh, specified in real-time logic, which is a first-order logic extended with the capability to annotate time, uh, absolute time. So first, some uh, preliminary, preliminary um, uh, introduction to the uh, to the work because I think uh, many of you may not be familiar with real time logic. Basically, this is a logic uh, that was motivated by um, basically conventional logics like uh, CTL and other linear time temporal logics cannot model time well, so they are capable of specifying. Um, related ordering of events, but not assigning time, absolute time, to these events and actions. So real-time logic was born in the, uh, in the late 80s. Basically, uh, we can specify a system in a behavioral fashion. So we do not need the structural functional description, which allows you to actually build a system. So here we, we, uh, we are able to specify the behavior of the system. And that's good enough for most purposes of verification. So an implementation is correct if the SP, the safety, uh, the, the specification of the system implies the safety assertion. So SP implies SA is a theorem. So that's the objective of verification here. Now, uh, there are three possible cases when you attempt to do this verification. First, SA is a theorem that can be derived from SP. So that's good. The system is safe. Uh, the second possibility is SA is not satisfiable with respect to SP. So here you have an engineer or, or a designer who doesn't know what he or she is doing. So it, uh, the specification is completely wrong. But most likely, uh, the third case occurs. So the system is safe if additional constraints are added. So you have the negation of the safety assertion uh, satisfiable under certain cases. So this is a situation where you most likely uh, find this technique and the tool implementing this technique to be useful. So you know, even expert programmer or designer can make a few bucks the first try. So this tool is able to basically identify these problems for you. And here the focus is on the timing properties as opposed to the uh, logical correctness properties. Now, here in this talk, I'm going to, to introduce an incremental approach for debugging. So what happens if, uh, if the verification tool tells you that there is a problem in certain areas? So this tool is able to tell you automatically what kind of constraints to add or to modify to make this into a correct specification. And this is the, uh, the, the high-level uh, look at this uh, algorithm. So with a timing constraint that I have 15 minutes to look at basically two, uh, two, two projects here, I'm not able to uh, talk about the details. But I'll be happy to, you know, uh, to discuss some more after, after the talk. So here you, you have basically a loop. And we incrementally uh, add new constraint until uh, the system is safe. So SP implies the safety assertion. Okay, specification implying the safety assertion. So basically, okay, in, in step three, okay, we are adding this new constraint. And later on, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit how these constraints are created or, and, and how they're actually added 
to the system. I guess feel free to stop me if you have you know questions you know in real time, and I'll be you know happy to answer that question. So let's look at the details of the approach. Um, here, the satisfiability of if you go back here. So we are doing this incrementally, starting with uh, k equals one, and k is incremented each time we add a new constraint. And basically, we like to check whether this new constraint make the SP, the new SP, closer to the correct specification. Okay, that's that's what we mean by incremental here. If it's going farther away, obviously we do not like that constraint. So originally, uh, we are doing this systematically, meaning that uh, there's a method, but it, it requires users' um, intervention, so users' uh, suggestion to see uh, to, to tell the system whether this constraint is, is going the right way. But eventually, we would like to have the system behave autonomously so that uh, the system that can be implemented in a robot, and it can check new plans, and the specification is written in, in this uh, uh, RTL, real-time logic language. So, so the satisfiability of the SP at the K plus one step, implying SA at the K plus one step, is expressed incrementally. Okay, from the uh, previous, uh, basically, uh, it's not a theorem, it's, it's what we are going to see if it becomes a theorem. Now, we're gonna use uh, the counting SAT uh, problem rather than the regular SAT. And the reason is because this allows us to know how far away the SP is from satisfying SA. And the modification of the SP and or SA is going to be useful in this debugging process. And bugs are fixed one at a time until the system is correct. That is why it's not good you know, to use this tool if your system is completely wrong. It would take a long time to be able to complete the debugging. But most of the people who uh, uh, develop uh, real-time systems are, you know, are, are, are basically experienced in the domain, so more likely you're, you're, you're making a few mistakes rather than a lot of mistakes. So motivations for this. Industrial systems, real systems, are going to have large specification, uh, not something you can feed into uh, a standard conference paper. So it is impractical for a system designer to, you know, to be able to go through this manually, you know, even if you have a team, and with regular software to find this uh, missing, missing constraint. So we need to have a, a tool to do that, and we call this tool SDRTL for systematic uh, debugger for real-time logic. So let's look at uh, real-time logic and look at some of the features and syntax of this language. I'm just curious uh, if you have seen or know something about real-time logic. Uh, maybe raise your hand. Okay, uh, only one or two. So okay, so um, because of the time constraint, I may not be able to go over all the details, but at least I'm going to show you the key, the key features. And the key feature is the occurrence function. Okay, it's, uh, we use the, uh, this add character to indicate that. And basically, this is an assignment of absolute time, integer absolute time, to the instance of a specific event. So for example, uh, this is the 15th time I press the, uh, uh, this button here, okay, the, the, the arrow button to go to the next slide. So I can say this occurs at time uh, 439 uh, and with uh, 20, 20 seconds. So I can do that in this, in this language. Okay. So here you can see the occurrence time of the i-th instance of event E is at time t. Okay, so the i occurrence of event E occurs at time t. So I can write formulas um, like this embedded in just conventional first order logic. I can specify here, for example, uh, this is the next instance. Okay, i plus one is the next instance event, uh, next instance of this event E. Okay, later on we'll look at a simple example so you, you can become familiar with this logic before we go over the, uh, the algorithm for verification and debugging. There are three types of real-time logic constraints. 
um, uh, constants. Uh, these are actions. These are schedulable units of work. So if this is a computer system, uh, that means uh, a, a task, a process, a threat. Okay, that is a schedulable unit of work. But these actions could be real actions. So this could be a robot arm moving from left to right. It could be the railroad crossing gate going up or going down. It could be a valve in a pipe closing or opening. So those are schedulable uh, units of work. Now, events constants are temporal markers, and these are instantaneous. So external event is indicated by omega. So, for example, I can have an external event of me pressing this arrow button. Okay, that's an external event. So I'm external to this uh, laptop. Start event means the beginning. Okay, it marks the beginning of um, of a of an action. Or, for example, I have the start event of the gate arm starting to move up or maybe move down. And this down arrow indicates the end event, the stop event of an action. So the, the gate is completely moved down. So that I can model this interval of time later on. And integers are used for timing constraints, for all the notations of time here. Uh, and the reason is because uh, if we have real numbers, there will be a problem. And you know, I'll be happy to discuss the reason why. OK, so this is an example, railroad crossing. So I come from Houston, uh, Texas, and there are lots of railroad crossings in, uh, intersection. And in Texas, people drive fast. Okay? And sometimes they ignore uh, you know, signs and, and traffic light. That's why we install intersection cameras to catch people who run a red light. So here, we light the gate. Um, so basically, you have cars here. Okay. And we like the gate to be completely moved down before the train, indicated by this uh, uh, darker green uh, rectangle, arrive at the intersection. So here there's a small sensor that detects the approach of a train. So once the uh, train is detected by the sensor, then it sends a signal to the gate controller, which is going to uh, lower the gate. Okay, so we like the gate to be completely down before the train arrives at the crossing. Because if not, the, the car may try to continue, you know, beat the intersection. Okay, okay, car arrives. Car moving forward. Okay, the train is coming. So these events are, are happening simultaneously. We cannot use a regular temporal logic to model this because typically it uses the interleaving model of computation. Uh, temporal logic was, the, uh, was used for concurrent, uh, to model concurrent systems, uh, concurrent processes. But real-time logic allows you to specify all this happening simultaneously or in parallel. Okay, car passes, car passes. Okay, the train is coming. Okay. And the gate is down. Okay, gate is down. Okay, so if there are more cars coming, uh, they cannot go through and the train goes through. After the train crosses the, the crossing, then the gate can start moving up. So that's the scenario we like to specify. It's a very simple system, uh, but it's good for uh, lecture, presentation, you know, discussion. Okay, so gate moves up. And you see this, uh, uh, the timing constraint or the timing uh, performance or, or behavior here. So it takes 45 seconds for the train to, uh, to reach the crossing from the sensor, and it takes 60 seconds. So it's, it's a sh there are only a few cards, so it takes 60 seconds for the train to pass. Okay. So now we're going to model this in real-time logic. Okay. So here is what we are going to say. When the train approaches the sensor, uh, a signal will initiate the lowering of the gate, and the gate is moved down to the position within 30 seconds and be uh, from being detected by the sensor because it takes 45 seconds for the train to arrive. So 30 seconds, you know, we have a 15, min, a 15 seconds uh, buffer zone. So the gate will be completely down uh, before the train arrives. So this is specified in, in real-time logic. Okay. You see, uh, the less than equal is to, in, because all this, all this um, real-time logic indicates integer time. So here, train approach is the occurrence time of the train approach, the x occurrence of that x instance, is less than or equal. So that means at or before uh, the start of the gate moving down. So 
when a chain is detected, then the gate is going to start moving down. It could be a little bit later. That's less than or equal. It's, it's going to indicate that. And notice that this is an N, so, and also the down gate, okay, um, the end of the down gate is going to occur less than or equal to the time the, the train approach happens plus 30. Okay, so the 30 is a deadline for uh, the, basically the occurrence time of the gate completely moving down. And this is captured in this uh, real-time logic statement. Okay. Now, the gate takes 15 seconds to lower itself, and this comes from the performance of this particular motor, you know, driving, uh, driving this uh, gate from the up to the down position. Okay. So this is considered a delay or computation time. Okay. This is uh, something that, again, is dependent on the actual gate controller and the gate and the weather. Okay. So this is specified, as you can see, the integer is on the left. And that usually indicates delay or computation time. And we use, you see, down gate here and down gate here. And this is a down arrow, and this is up, up arrow. So we are really relating the end, the two endpoints, the beginning and the end point of the same action. And this tells you the computation time. So very complex system can also be specified. You just have a lot of uh, RTL uh, uh, formulas. Now. The next thing we like to say is, if the train needs at least 45 seconds to go from the sensor to the crossing, and the train crossing is completed within 60 seconds from being detected by the sensor, then we are guaranteed that at the start of the train crossing, the gate has moved down, and that the train leaves the crossing within 45 seconds from the time the gate has been completely uh, and has, has, has been completely moved down. So this is captured. This is captured by this uh, this statement in our TL. Okay. So you see, this is a, if this happened, then this is going to happen. Okay. So this is really the safety assertion, and we like to relate this safety assertion uh, with the specification, which is which will capture here. Okay. A very simple system, but I think it illustrates what we are trying to do here. Questions uh, so far? Okay. So now uh, the the class of formulas that are in this format is um, is called path RTL. It's a subclass of RTL because by now the the theorist in the audience will say, okay, this is first order logic is not decidable. So so how can we have you know, claim to have an efficient uh, solution? But this is only a subclass of the RTL formulas. And for this, we can have an efficient solution. Notice that all these uh, statements have basically an occurrence, occurrence function, plus or minus an integer, less than or equal to another occurrence function. And they are connected with uh, connectives like n. And of course, you know, basic logic course will tell you that this imply can be changed, right? So it becomes not the um, uh, the premise or the consequence, so it can be changed to a logical connectives other than the uh, implied symbol, right? But but you can see, you know, all this, okay, have the occurrence function plus or minus here. In this case, is a zero integer is zero, less than or equal to another occurrence function. So if your uh, formulas are of this form, then they are called path RTL, and for this we can do, we can come up with a general algorithm. Now, in the worst case, this is still exponential time, and hence, you know, the 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 um, the objective of this talk is to basically push the envelope by uh, saying that in fact a lot of these formulas can be uh, analyzed in in uh, polynomial time. Okay, so this is the form, as I said, uh, the form of the formulas. Uh, occurrence function plus or minus integer less than or equal to fun to another occurrence function. Now we have analyzed uh, several um, Brio systems, uh, including uh, railroad crossing. Well, the system I have is very small, but there could be multiple tracks. Okay, uh, we have analyzed a nuclear reactor, a Boeing 77, the uh, uh, the airplane uh, in integrated air airplane information management systems, and also the X38. Uh, this is, uh, uh, in fact, um, 
I have a full description of this in the 99 paper and also in my textbook. So just do a little bit advertising here. So I have a textbook that talks about all this and plus more. But obviously, uh, the, um, uh, the results here, the main results, uh, it's actually beyond the textbook. It's, it's published more recently. And can you give us an idea of how large the specification of something like this is? Sure. Uh, the, um, both the Boeing and this system, we are talking about uh, hundreds of formulas. So like 500, 600. The railroad crossing is much smaller. Okay. This one is actually a simplified version. It's about 100 formulas uh, in our tier before conversion to, to the format we need, uh, which are cross or form, and that has more crosses. So, so the that's a complete spacecraft is just hundreds of formulas. That's right. Well, this is not a complete spacecraft. This is only this, this module, okay, the, uh, that uh, integrated airplane information management module. It's only a, a, a small subset, I must say, not the entire aircraft. The entire aircraft, you're talking about millions of uh, formulas. Okay. That's right, exactly. And the part that we can get our hands on, meaning you know, the source code. You know. So as acad you know, people in academia, as faculty members, we, we may not be able to get you know, the source code so easily, uh, especially if it's a private companies. And if it's the defense department, it's even, even harder. So, yeah, but even with hundreds of formulas, doing it by hand is impossible. And um, uh, with conventional model checking, for this kind of thing, it's, it's, it's still too large because there's a time dimension uh, in, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this problem. Okay, so let's see. Let's look at how we translate these formulas. We need to do some processing before we can, uh, before we can actually analyze this using our algorithm. So first, we are going to uh, uh, translate uh, these formulas with the occurrence function into um, something uh, that's called Pressburger arithmetic. Basically, we, we are replacing the occurrence function into something that's more mathematical looking, more familiar to you. And for those that have up arrow and down arrow to indicate the start and end time of the, uh, of the action, we use the same function name, but we use one and two to denote the beginning and the end of these actions. Okay? So that, that, that shows that these two functions are related. You know, this shows the end points of that, of that action. So that's the SP. And this is the safety property, again, or translated into uh, uh, Pressburger. Now, oops. OK. So we are not going to actually verify this directly. In, in fact, uh, we are going to prove uh, by contradiction. So we are going to encode the negation of this uh, uh, SP implying SA uh, formula. So not parenthesis SP implying SA. So basically this. And the reason is, if we encode this, then we need to just find one counter example. And the original formula is, is proven. Again, this is very basic logic. So you see, I do some. Um, um, basically, this becomes this, and finally it becomes this. So SP and not SA. Okay. So I'm going to encode SP and not SA in a type of graph called a constraint graph. So SP imply SA is a theorem if and only if uh, SP and not SA is unsatisfiable. I'm proving by contradiction. So SP remains the same, but I need to negate the SA. Okay? And negating the SA, uh, again, if you have some logic uh, background, the uh, for all becomes the exist here. So this gives a little bit of problem. So we need to scolemize, use scolem constant here. Okay? So scolem constant means, OK, this capital T and U means this is for a specific uh, value, not for all. So this is called a scolem constant. And this is the form after the negation. Now, some of the less than or equal becomes greater than. And again, we do some simple arithmetic trick. You see the 60 becomes a, becomes a minus uh, 59 here. So I can use this less than or equal. Because all the formulas have to be written as occurrence function plus or minus an integer less than or equal okay, for, for this to work. And the reason is, if we are looking for a cycle, a uh, circular path in a graph. Okay, I will show you shortly. 
So again, summarizing, we have original formulas, we get the Pressburger formulas, and then we put into the clause of form, like this. Okay. Basically, each clause is a disjunction. Okay. Uh, if, if it's only N, then we write on separate lines. And the objective is to find positive cycles. So, so I haven't told you about the graph yet, but shortly. Okay, let me go to that. Um, okay, so this is a graph we want to build. So you, you, you create a node for each function. If the function has a scolem constant like here f of t, okay, I'm going to create another, another node. So this is kind of like a more complex graph. It's called a constraint graph. So f of t is a separate node, but it's obviously related to f of uh, lowercase x. So I build a graph like that, and the edge uh, has a weight. And the weight is that integer constant that is in the plus or minus uh, in these formulas. OK, right here. So you have either plus 45, plus 1, or minus 59. That is the weight. That's the weight on the graph. So you see minus 30, minus 15, uh, 0 here. So now the objective is to find positive cycles in this graph. And let's see if there's any here. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you don't have positive cycles, that is bad. Because we are proving by count example. So if you have positive cycle, we are done. If you have no positive cycles, that means you have a bug in your specification. So, so it's very quick. The problem is if you have a disjunction, then you need to find two or more cycles because of the or. So one could be true, but the cycle could have gone to the other, other part. But, but if there are no positive cycle, you have a bug. Okay? So we have avoided using resolution, which is the standard procedure to use on, uh, on the Pressburger arithmetic formulas. So here, if you identify positive cycles, there's a bug. And in fact, there's a bug here. Okay? Um, so we need to redesign, and uh, the goal is to do this fully automatically, autonomously. Okay. Uh, so here is adding some new edges to the graph and new nodes. So this is suggested by the tool. Again, uh, I don't really have time to go into details, but I think you get, get the idea. Um, and finally, okay, uh, this is telling you how to uh, basically add uh, cycles to the graph, or you transform, okay, let me go back here. So adding cycles to the graph to create positive cycles, or maybe transforming a negative cycle into a positive one. Okay. That, of, that of course will modify existing constraint, or maybe have to create new constraint, new formulas. Okay. So this is how the system works. Obviously the more you know about the domain, Let's say this is for airplane avionics. Uh, the better, okay, the tool is going to to respond. So it's going to encode domain knowledge. So there's some knowledge-based systems inside. Yeah. Uh, of course, you can just do this blindly. You know, just search you know around the area and see if uh, you get a more correct specification, as I told you earlier. Because with the counting SAT, um, let's see. Let's go back here. With the incremental counting SAT, there's a numerical value that tells you how far away you're from the correct solution. And that's why we're using that. Again, I think I'm going to skip some details here. That's, uh, yeah, you but you can go ahead. So it seems, an, uh, it seems to me a problem with this is if you try to fix the specification, hmm? there are many ways for you to do that. That's right. right. Yes. So among all the possibilities and how you take Right. You pick the, the one that has the, basically the better score. So because for each of these fixes, there's a numerical score that we get from this counting SAT. And that is from the domain knowledge? No, that's without domain knowledge. With the domain knowledge, it's even better. So you can say this one has a higher priority you know, to be added. Okay. Yeah. But without so. domain knowledge, then the score corresponds to what? Basically, how, how far away you are from the correct SP implying SA. So let's go back here. So basically this. Because the score would be zero if you, are, if you have this. Well, SP implies SA. This is actually the negation. So yeah, basically this. So the score would be zero. So you are there. Okay. 
But the farther away, the more miss constraint missing, or the more incorrect are your numbers in these timing constraint, there will be a larger number. Okay. So, yeah, that's, that's uh, so. The, the the goal is to give you an in intuitive idea here, not not to actually, you know, show all the details. It will take more than an hour just to talk about this part, actually. But I encourage you to look at the IEEE transactions paper last July. Uh, it get, it gives you a lot of the information here, and there's some other conference papers at RTSS and RTAS, and there are there are description of the titles in my website uh, and. Uh, they are abstract, but actually you can get it from IEEE or some of them from ACM, okay, from the digital libraries. Okay, so let's go back. Um, yeah, there's some uh, related work uh, with incremental techniques, so I'm not claiming we're the first. Uh, but they have done this for other, other, uh, other models, other languages, uh, like uh, uh, mu calculus, you know, and... Um, but not for real-time logic. So this is uh, this is brand new for for real-time logic. And also, there's some discussion on the uh, SAT problem and the incremental SAT. And of course, SAT was uh, defined in 1971 by Cook. Okay, so so we add the tool allows us to add, to add basically uh, uh, um, uh, cycles, positive cycles, or you know which may be uh, that could be created by adding a, one edge, or that could be changing some numbers. That could mean changing the constraints, right? or you may add. You, you may need to add several edges and nodes in order to create one. And as I said, if you have this junction of crosses, you need several cycles, and you need to build a search tree in order to uh, to be sure that um, you have a uh, a counter example, and hence the original formula. The unnegated formula is uh, what you want. SP imply SA. Okay, so initially, uh, you know, you can obviously do this manually. So here we are proposing, of course, a mechanical tool that eventually can be fully automated. Okay, and here we are working on the specification, not on the actual code. Uh, but eventually, we want to do that to actual code uh, or actual uh, communication protocol in any networking. Okay, so again, go back to the railroad crossing. And uh, as I just mentioned, you can add new arc, new edges, or you can transform negative cycles. Okay. And the key point is the, is the increment. Okay, so associated with each change, there's a, there's a cost, okay, it's the increment. And of course, the, the closer uh, it is to the, uh, to, the, to the theorem, we want to prove SP implies SA, the better. So we, we will choose that one. Sometimes there's a tie, or maybe there are too many choices. So we may have to pick at random. The more choices you have that have the same score, uh, the expert, the domain expert would definitely help there. Because typically, if you wrote a program, okay, then there's a bug, uh, you, you know, and the system identifies it, very likely you know, okay, ah, this is what I did. So I fix that. So I choose that that particular choice. So definitely, with the human uh, domain expert, uh, the developer, the 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 tool will run much faster. Okay, so you you have maybe the correct constraint much faster. But even if you don't have an expert, eventually, you know the convergence issue. You know, so far the system converged. That's a question I get when I give talks at at other places is convergence. But so far we have observed that. Convergence is is uh, is it's, it occurs 100% of the times with the uh, test cases we have. There are some real test cases which just remove some formulas or maybe change some numbers, and it gets back to the uh, basically the correct specification. And we also create a synthetic uh, formulas, and again the the two performs well. But we cannot say 100% sure. So that's another topic in itself, is proving the convergence. So, so I'm still looking for a student who is very theoretically oriented to, to tackle that, that issue. Okay. So we, actually, we have a tool, and I can refer you to a website. And there's a link from my website. So you can actually run this and try it. So it's not like we just have a paper or papers, but you can try this tool. You know, um, and you can download and try all the examples I have there. And the links is from my from my website. So this is an actual run of uh, of the system. 
Okay, and it shows this graphically. Uh, okay, it's, it's, here it shows two two crosses are, are are missing. Okay, oops, right, and then it it adds this uh, uh, crosses and to, in in order to to create uh, positive cycles. All right, I think I'm going to skip some details on the choices of some of the parameters and go go to the results directly because I do want to spend some time on security, I think, because a lot of uh, faculty members and students here uh, are working on security. And that's why I added this bonus, okay? Because initially I sent uh, David uh, the, uh, the, the verification talk, but I figured out, okay, uh, even though security is not my main research area, lately I have basically some ideas of applying some of this work, real-time logic, in the security, in the modeling and, and verifying uh, security protocols or intrusion detection systems. In a way, if we can prove the system to be correct, then security is staying Oh, that's right. <laughs> that would be hard, yeah. But that's the ultimate goal, and, and that's a good setting point if you can sell this to a client and say this is certified, you know. Uh, with this, okay, it's a guarantee. Yeah. Unfortunately, in the real world, there are far more constraints, far more uncertainties that you can model. You know, that's basically the the domain of uh, 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 input is it's infinite. You know, so it's it's very hard to to do that. But eventually, we want to do that. Maybe maybe on a, a certain piece of the protocol or IDS, the certain core of it. Okay, so this. This uh, real graph just shows you the um, if you have uh, one, two, three, four constraints missing, and the time it takes on just a standard PC, you know, not a supercomputer, to complete this uh, uh, debugging and verification, and this shows the numbers for uh, in seconds for uh, railroad crossing, the reactor, and also the X38, which is the crew return vehicle for the International Space Station. You know, this is a lifeboat to return astronauts uh, back to Earth in the event of uh, an accident on board, uh, instead of sending a Russian spacecraft to retrieve them, which takes much longer. Okay. All right, so that's actually a prototype of this X-38. Um, uh, unfortunately, right now, this project is put on hold uh, by NASA because of budget reason. So astronauts have to wait for the Russian, or maybe a shuttle launch, which is often delayed, right, uh, to retrieve the astronauts if there are problems. And I think recently they have some, uh, I forgot exactly the issue, it's oxygen or maybe CO2 detected in the, in the capsule. So, so it could be serious, right? So this is something um, used to test uh, the, uh, the system. And we X38, the, the part that we analyzed is the scheduling part of the avionics. It uses four power PC for Byzantine agreement and for redundancy. And this is drop uh, high up in the air, uh, and then it can return autonomously back to Earth. So this is a high level view of our tool. So SDRTL is what we have, and then AD is the more advanced version that can basically do it almost automatically. Okay, so it's, uh, and then um, this uh, basically um, telling you, you know, the uh, old specification and incremental specification. And eventually we want to do this uh, fully autonomously. Okay, uh, future work. Mm. We, we want to basically, uh, as I said, the, uh, beside the autonomous thing, uh, we are doing optimization. I didn't show it on this slide. And what happens if you have a platform, a processing platform, that is slower than what you already ha what you have. So can it still you know meet this uh, uh, specification? Because if it's slower, then your actions are going to take longer. Okay? If you are aware, uh, you know, power aware computing. If you are familiar with that, if you run your laptop at a slower speed, then it takes longer uh, to show your PowerPoint slides or run your applications. Um, we like to. Um, basically combine this technique with uh, scheduling, the scheduling research. Okay, uh, I should acknowledge this is uh, joint work with uh, uh, Stefan Andre and his group at the National University of Singapore, I think NSF, and also the Institute of, uh, for Space Systems Operation. And these are some of the references. Okay. Um, right. Okay, so so that concludes the first part of my talk. Next, I'm going to 
go to the um, uh, security part of the talk. So any, any questions about the first part? So I think I have about nine minutes and 30 seconds. And I'm going to just uh, tell you a little bit about the issues and the challenges in this area. As I said, this is a brand new area for me too. We just started this uh, last, um, late last year. So I don't have a lot of hard results. Okay? Uh, but I will tell you uh, an approach that we're going to take based on knowledge or rule-based systems. So let's see. OK, motivations. Uh, these are embedded systems. Uh, your car, your future car may not have a steering wheel, so joysticks. Okay. Uh, patient monitoring in hospital, so uh, uh, this is the space shuttle. <coughs> so typically in this system, um, uh, security is becoming I I important, but typically uh, people are more concerned with getting the correct result and having it verified for timing. Uh, correctness and logical correctness. And uh, security is not the main topic there. But I think the more these systems are deployed, I think it's that we need to incorporate a certain level of um, a security mechanism. So I do work also in embedded systems. So this is a, a Intel board that we have uh, to, to check out some DBS algorithms that we have developed to uh, basically save power while still meeting the timing constraint. Um, this is a simple fixed uh, wireless sensor network test bed uh, that my student and another colleague in the department have set up. Uh, and we have an intrusion detection system uh, running here. And this is really a test bed because one of my students has a sleeping bag underneath. Okay, so, yeah. So, I, he's not underneath right now, but there are lots of wiring and, you know, power stuff downstairs. He is, is in the table here. It's, and afterwards, he took it out. He said, oh, that's OK. I show this. It's more funny. You know? it's, a, it's a test bed, and there's really a bed underneath. OK, it's a sleeping bed. So, so, so we, what we are doing right now is we want to specify this IDS in real-time logic. Okay, so that's one project. And then use the tool uh, to analyze. So here, of course, uh, we are, uh, we're focused on the timing. So from the time intruder goes in, and modify things, or maybe send uh, an incorrect package. We like to bound this uh, response time in, in detection. So that's, that's one problem okay, uh, uh, with respect to this uh, setup. Okay. Now, a typical real-time system is like this. So you have a, um, a system that is being monitored and controlled. Okay, that's T. And the sensor input. And then there's a decision system consisting of hardware and software. State information tells you about what's happening before. And then you have to make a decision to determine what to do next. It could be uh, changing the, uh, uh, the temperature setting, so you activate the air conditioner. Or it could be opening a valve to let fluids go through, in, let's say, in a refinery or a chemical process. Uh, or it could be activating an anti-lock brake right, to avoid skidding. So, so all of this can be modeled like this. But in reality, there are more in, in, a, in a modern control systems. Okay, so you have a user interface, so the UI folks, uh, user interface folks would, would, be, uh, would be working on this. There's networking, so you may have this system in a control area network, or you may have a system that is actually activated remotely, maybe through an internet, that would not be good. Uh, unless you certify and verify that you have uh, the system safely operating. So you don't want to have a robot arm in another room in Houston, and I'm changing it here, and hacker, you know, uh, gets in and modify this transmission. So, or you have something maybe more closely uh, coupled, you know, like, like in a car. And then within the uh, control system, you have uh, monitoring, decision making, actuation, and also uh, the, the, the target system, so which is shown in this simplified picture. OK, so what are the issues in an IDS in, in such a setting? Uh, some of this, of course, in the wireless sensor networks, the nodes may be running on battery. Um, so the first, the, two first, uh, the first thing, of course, is accuracy. That's, that's well known to you, right? So it should, the IDS should identify no or few uh, false positives, no or few false 
negatives. But here, timeliness is important. So you don't want to add the IDS and violate the original timing constraint of the application. Okay, so if your sensor is going to detect um, uh, maybe temperature changes or maybe uh, CO2 uh, in the air, then I don't want to affect that timing. You know, if you if you add this IDS module to it, scalability. Can you scale? You know, from small to large, or or vice versa. And power awareness. This is something that has not been thought of much in in the security community, and we intend to work on this. How do you get some security, some intrusion detection, uh, without basically uh, violating the real time uh, constraints that you have? Okay. So one approach we are taking is uh, based on automatic rule-based uh, generation. So I think here there's a group that is working on automata inlining, so you can model the legal and illegal behavior. Uh, because if you want to model everything, that's not possible. If you want to trace all the possible packets being exchanged, all the execution, all the library calls, that's not possible. But here we, 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 we give another twist. And, and the reason is I work on rule-based systems uh, for a long time. And we have a, a polynomial time tool that can tell you whether uh, a system can meet the deadline constraint. So meaning the worst case execution time, it's always uh, less than or equal to the deadline. And we can do this for, a again, a large class of systems. Again, the, the problem is not decidable in general. So the objective here is um, to use a, to automatically generate this rule-based program that represent the legal execution behavior of a given application program uh, in this embedded system. And, and now, but the tool that I have only tells you the timing. Uh, here we are checking for security. So we need to encode this as timing, um, basically timing constraint. And we have some experience doing that, but not <coughs> encoding security, but rather regular safety properties. So we, we conjecture that we can do this. And our technique to do the analysis fast is using something called uh, semantic analysis. That's why we can avoid the uh, state space, the reachability graph analysis that is needed if you use uh, an automata-based uh, technique. Okay. Now, at runtime, we're going to append new rules to this uh, uh, automatically generated uh, rule set uh, that has the legal behavior represented. <laughs> And this use a new new program. Now, if these rules are dependent on the current execution sequences, if some of them are you know are becoming illegal or maybe it's from the intruder, then we'll be able to detect it with this technique. Again, this is incremental, so it's more efficient. Um, I think I need to skip an example because I have a minute and a half left. But anyway, this is the form of the rule base. It's a uh, a propositional logic based language. We also have a uh, um, first order logic based language for MLL. EQL is the, is the simple one. But this is enough for, for our purpose. And we use semantic analysis and based on special forms that we have proven to satisfy certain timing constraint. Okay, so um, we can have a program like this and analyze using this strategy. Again, using a compositional and incremental approach. Uh, so we can analyze a rule-based program, breaking it down into uh, smaller pieces, and then combining the results. OK, so I just want to conclude the call. You know, there's a lot of avenues for further research in this area. And I'll be happy to share with you the, uh, uh, some of the workshop papers uh, where I have you know, described more details. Uh, they are available on my website. And I like to, of course, show you some pictures. Uh, ho uh, photography is my hobby, so I usually take pictures of my group at, at, at conferences. And this is at ARTAS 2005. Uh, Stefan is here uh, from NUS. This is at the Martian Robot Competition at RTSS. Okay. This is at my lab. There's a CS Open House. Uh, this is Wang Wu from Princeton visiting us. Uh, Jeanette Wynn, who is now the head of CISE, uh, keynote speaker, and final picture uh, taken recently in my lab with my students. Thank you.
Thank you.